At the outbreak of the First World War, Germany had few major overseas naval stations, having concentrated the majority of her fleet in the North Sea. Of the small collection of minor forces, there was one crown jewel, the German East Asiatic Squadron, based in Tsingtao. This fleet was extremely powerful, centering around two of the most modern armored cruisers in the world, Scharnhorst and Neisenau. The fleet was commanded by Vice Admiral Maximilian von Spee, who was one of the greatest naval commanders of the era. A Catholic and a dominantly Protestant country, von Spee was something of an enigma. He had a distinctive personality and was well liked by his men. His mind was sharp, and he would often consult his staff and crews with problems, but when a decision had been made, the decision was final. His experience as a younger officer in Tsingtao had given him a great deal of knowledge about the geography of the Pacific, which prepared him well for the months to come. The Germans had come to acquire Tsingtao the way many others had obtained ports in China. When the British had first forced the Chinese to cede several ports following their victory in the Opium Wars, the other powers of Europe began eyeing the region as an area in which to create a sphere of influence. The newly created state of Germany was quick to get in on the fad that was imperialism. Inheriting the Treaty of Peking, which allowed Prussian warships to operate in Chinese waters, the Imperial German Navy bided its time, and when the First Sino-Japanese War broke out in 1894, the Kaiser created the German East Asiatic Squadron. In 1896, then Rear Admiral Alfred Tirpitz assumed command of the force, and was ordered to find a base suitable to support his fleet. Tirpitz presented several options to the government, but grumblings delayed the process, and Tirpitz would be recalled back to Germany, after which Wilhelm lost interest in the region, preferring to focus on the buildup of the high seas fleet. The subsequent commander, Rear Admiral von Deidrich, picked up where Tirpitz had left off, and concurred with the opinion of his predecessor that the Bay of Gapjo was best suited for the task. And while high command continued to waver, Deidrich prepared to act. Finally, after offers were refused by the Chinese when the Germans attempted to buy the land, a pair of German missionaries were conveniently murdered, giving Deidrich cause to land his troops on November 14, 1897. Shortly thereafter, the convention at Peking granted the Germans a 99-year lease on Gapjo in the surrounding lands, which they began to develop. By 1914, with von Spee in command since 1912, Tsingtao was a thriving German colony. Immediately prior to the outbreak of World War I, von Spee had hosted an annual review with ships from the Royal Navy acting as guests of honor, with games between ships, balls, and dinners. There was a sense of tension in the air as the political situation in Europe was beginning to turn sour, and the officers and men of the respective fleets knew they could be at war shortly. After the British departed, the inevitable finally occurred, and von Spee was now 5,000 miles from Germany by land, far more by sea. The German admiral swiftly recognized that there was little hope for him staying put where he was. His force consisted of the armored cruisers Scharnhorst and Eisenau, and the light cruisers Leipzig, Nuremberg, and Emden. This force paled in comparison to several others in the region, with the Royal Australian Navy chief among von Spee's concerns. Headed by the indefatigable class battlecruiser, the Australia, this force was powerful enough to handily take down von Spee, something that he understood. Convening his staff, he laid forward his plan to sail across the Pacific, eventually arriving in Chile. Utilizing Germany's islands as coaling points, the voyage would be long and arduous for the relatively smaller ships. The force was relatively fractured at the outset of the conflict, the Scharnhorst and Neisenau in the Carolines, while the other ships were at various ports or on routine patrol missions. Von Spee ordered the squadron to rendezvous at Pagan Island in the northern Marianas. While the ships were coaling, Von Spee and his commanders plotted their next move. All concurred that they could not stay, and that their only option was to return to Germany. Even this choice presented problems for the force, as the British had discreetly cut the undersea cables used by the East Asia squadron that ran through their waters, completely severing the line of communication between Berlin and Von Spee. His communication with home thus cut, von Spee sent Nuremberg to Hawaii to gather news and intelligence on the war. This proved wise, as Nuremberg's area of operation was the west coast of Mexico, and thus her presence in neutral Hawaii would not betray von Spee's location. Only one ship was left behind, the Emden, when her captain persuaded von Spee to allow him to raid merchant shipping in the Indian Ocean, which could serve as a distraction for the escape of the East Asiatic Squadron. He had demonstrated he could do so successfully while isolated in the opening days of the war, and so the Emden sailed off, leaving von Spee and his four ships alone in the vast Pacific Ocean. Setting sail for German Samoa, von Spee brought in tow with him Scharnhorst and Neisenau. Following this, he turned east, 
bombarding the French colony of Papite along the way. Rejoined by Nuremberg, she brought ill news, as the ship had learned while in Hawaii that the British had captured German Samoa. Now unable to turn back, Von Spee had to press forward. Meeting up once again to coal at Easter Island, Von Spee recognized that due to the increase of naval activity in the Pacific, caused by both the Japanese entry into the war and Emden attracting much attention to herself as she sank ship after ship, the element of surprise was rapidly being lost. Some good news came in knowing that the sister of the Emden, the Dresden, was heading to reinforce him. Dresden was in the Caribbean when war broke out, and after being ordered to stay in the Atlantic, her captain decided to take her into the South Atlantic to conduct his operations there. Matching her sister, Dresden began raiding British shipping, but when this was no longer successful, she ventured into the Pacific to join von Spee at Easter Island. The force was also strengthened by the arrival of Leipzig, who had been operating off the Mexican coast when war broke out. Continuing towards the Chilean coast, it was at this point that von Spee became aware of the fact that the British light cruiser, HMS Glasgow, was moored alone in the harbor of Coronel. Knowing he would be heading in that direction anyway, the German admiral decided to make his first major offensive move against the Royal Navy. Unbeknownst to von Spee, he would not be intercepting one ship, but an entire squadron. Enter stage left, Rear Admiral Sir Christopher Kit Craddock. The current commander of the Royal Navy's North American and West Indies station, Craddock had been close to the royal family, but this bias in his promotion did not mean he was an incompetent officer by any stretch of the imagination. He too had a good reputation, and was well known for being headstrong, once commenting that he wished to either die on the hunting fields or in the heat of battle. His initial mission before the war had been to ensure the security of the British colonies near Mexico, as the nation was in the midst of a revolution at the time. Just before the war, he was ordered by Admiralty to redirect his efforts to confront the threat of the German ocean liners trapped in New York Harbor, who believed that these ships would be converted into armed merchant cruisers and sent to prey on British sea lanes. Admiralty directed three cruisers to be sent, and Craddock subsequently sent two of his ships and later joined them, arriving before war was declared. After some engagements with renegade liners and a German light cruiser in the region, Craddock then received reinforcements in the shape of HMS Good Hope, which he transferred his flag to. Getting word of shipping losses that gradually were slipping south, Admiralty ordered Craddock to proceed to the South Atlantic to form a brand new South American station. It was then that they also gave him the old pre-dreadnought, HMS Canopus. This decision would prove to cause serious problems for the Admiral in the months to come. The overmanagement of Craddock's forces on Admiralty's part was causing his ability to make judgment on the operational needs of his ships nearly impossible. On September 14, 1914, they informed him that Admiral von Spee's forces were possibly trying to round Cape Horn or transit the Strait of Magellan, and that he was to dispatch forces sufficient to cover any contingent threats in the Atlantic while making speed with the remainder of his forces to intercept von Spee. To help him ensure victory, he was given the armored cruiser HMS Defense, more modern than any vessel in his fleet, and more than a match for the German warships. Admiralty made a mistake, however, and ordered that while Craddock waited for defense to arrive, he was to keep his forces minimum strength to at least Canopus and Good Hope. Tied down to the older, slower pre-dreadnought, Craddock's ability to utilize Good Hope's somewhat decent speed was nullified if she remained attached to Canopus. Then the situation grew even more complicated when intelligence reports indicated von Spee was heading back west, causing Admiralty to believe he was trying to link up with the Emden. Convinced the danger had lessened, they ordered defense to abort the mission to support Craddock, but critically did not tell him. It wasn't until October 5, 1914, that Admiralty realized von Spee was likely still headed for South America, and they subsequently informed the beleaguered Craddock to be prepared for action. Herein lay a snapshot, however, perfectly encapsulating the essence of the problem with the Admiralty's micromanagement. Their message didn't get to Craddock for two full days. The delay in communications caused by the limitation of getting a message from one hemisphere to the other. Near the end of October, it became clear that the German ships were not far, and had made it to the western coast of South America. Craddock prepared to do battle, despite the fact that his force was significantly outmatched due to the age of his ships and the relative inexperience of their crews. Craddock only had in possession two armored cruisers, Monmouth and Good Hope, as well as the light cruiser, the Glasgow. This was supported by the armed merchant cruiser Otranto, and of course the pre-dreadnought Canopus. Admiralty's vague orders intended to tell Craddock that he was to center his forces around the battleship, but what he interpreted them to mean was that they wished for him to leave the unit behind in order to intercept the Germans at speed head-on. Unfortunately, upheaval in the Admiralty had been the culprit behind their sudden lack of clarity. 
First Sea Lord Prince Louis of Battenberg was being forced to resign due to public anti-German sentiment, and his successor, Admiral Sir Jackie Fisher, was not yet ready as he had just emerged from retirement. He tried to tell Craddock directly not to sail without Canopus and also redirected defense to return, but it was too late. By the time the message got there, the damage had been done. One final cruel twist that had shaped Craddock's decision-making were the recent findings of the Trowbridge court-martial, which occurred after the admiral in question had refused to engage a superior force in the Mediterranean. The message sent by the admiralty following this case was clear. Commanders were to engage enemies, no matter the risk. And so, on Halloween of 1914, the sun set one last time over the tranquil Pacific. Von Spee had survived his odyssey across the largest body of water on the planet. Now, he would have to sail straight into the jaws of the lion.